today we are going to go over the accredited investor requirements. So an important topic that's, you know, it, it's very, it's very simple, but I'm finding a lot of uh, folks do not. Oh, can you see my screen? Yes. Yes. Okay, good. Okay. Uh, a lot of folks that um, are either becoming accredited investors or syndicators or fund managers that are working with accredited investors specifically, there's a huge, um, I guess, void of information that uh, that falls to the wayside. So we're just gonna—it's just—it's just like a high-level or, overview. It's not all like we don't get into the, the granule aspect of the accredited investor, but um, but obviously we just do Q and A and just kind of talk about stuff. The material here is for informational purposes only. It should not be construed as investment or legal advice. It's presented from a reliable source. No presentations are made by our firm or another party's information accuracy and completeness. Even though we did verify this information, just have to put that out there. Um, all securities offered through Boost Capital Group LLC is representative do not provide tax or legal advice and nothing here should be construed as an offer or a solicitation to buy or sell securities. And always consult with your tax advisor or CPA in the real estate niche. Paula. Oh, All right. So, so this was a presentation I recently put together for somebody else's, uh, I guess, podcast. So it covered myself and Philippe, uh, who we pretty much uh, work with, high net worth individuals, busy professionals, business owners. Um, we've been in business for over a decade. And this was about me, my family. Um, Immigrant Cute. and Marine Corps veteran. I uh, went to an entrepreneurship program at Purdue University. I started with fix and flip, uh, so residential fix and flips, and then transitioned into multifamily. Uh, married, have two kids. One doesn't live with us, and I live in Virginia. We live in Virginia. Okay, who's the picture right up the top? Oh, I'm sorry, in the red shirt. Who is that? That's my 21-year-old son. Really? You don't look that old. He's, he's handsome. I thought <laughs> that he was you. I thought he was you with big hair. <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, no, he's uh, he's 21. Um, and he lives in North Mark Carolina. That's very pretty. So that's very pretty. That's my wife, Brittany. She's beautiful. Thank you. So, um, so like I said, we're gonna go over what it means to be a credit investor. Um, so who does not who, who's not familiar with a credit investor? Well, let, let me just go ahead and go over it. So the biggest thing um, with when you're investing, when you have a credit investors, um, all the, the main thing is that all participants that are accredited investors are fina financially sophisticated and able to able to fend for themselves or sustain the risk of loss. This is from the SEC of why it's important for any investors that you're working with that are accredited investors to meet these requirements. And these are gonna change January 1st, right? The accredited investors? Yes. Fit, the FinCEN rules, Mauricio Raul just told us. Yeah, so about that, that will be the ability, the, 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 um, access for accredited investors to be able to invest that would be based on an exam yes that's seri that's one of the ways he said yes series right. 65 yeah right so um regulation 506 uh a rule 506 of regulation d actually that's not wrong that's not right that's rule 501 of regulation d which encompasses 504 506 B and C. So with 506C exemptions, an investor can raise an unlimited amount of money. Okay, the biggest differences here are 506B obviously is for non-accredited investors, but only up to 35 non-accredited investors and must be sophisticated investors. For rule 506B, C, I'm sorry, you can advertise any and every way you want. Right. But as the offering um, firm, you have to ensure that all 
offerings are made to only accredited investors and you take reasonable steps to verify that they are accredited investors. And we'll go over that a little bit on options on how to make that determination, which I'm sure you guys know this. So are you a credit investor? So this is something that in 2020, the SEC amended the definition of what an credit investor. So long story short, that's for now includes individuals who have professional certifications or credentials or individuals who are knowledgeable employees of a private fund. So if you're in a private fund, you're an employee that handles a lot of the firm's fund uh, aspects, you will con be considered an accredited investor. And then also SEC and state registered investment advisors. So individuals who have professor uh, certifications can include the series seven, 65 and 82. So why does this matter? So under under Rule 501 Reg D, the the biggest thing is like at the beginning, the logic is that the credit investors they meet the test to be financially sophisticated and have room and have risk tolerance. So pretty much they can lose their capital and be okay. That's the biggest thing with protecting folks that are non-accredited versus accredited investors. They have the the mindset and the know-how and the capital to be able to survive a loss. Now, why additionally it matters as a firm or a syndicator that if you found to be um, accepting capital from non-accredited investors, you are in serious violation and are subject to significant fines. So investors that are accredited are only uh, allowed in your 506 c deal because obviously to protect for protection purposes of non-accredited as well as being fined because you are accepting non-accredited capital which becomes difficult because then you have a lot of non-accredited that can't play in your deals so um so it's very important now who's a credit investor as we know Folks that exceed two hundred thousand dollars of income annually, or married three hundred thousand, and have have expected to receive that in the same year for the past two years, or have a net worth of over a million dollars, not to include their primary residence. Right. And then the additional, uh, the change, the, um, the amendment to the uh, credit investor based on the SEC rules is a household that has a Series 7, 65, or 82 license. So that's their professional, um, um, their, their licenses. So that's, that's the 2020 change. So it's been around for a while. But yet, I don't see that advertised very often. Okay, continuing on the accredited investor, also uh, trust and entities that exceed $5 million, but without the purpose of it being formed for a specific um, deal. So if uh, kind of like a, uh, what is it? Uh, not a, drawing a blank here. No, not a DST. I'm drawing a blank here. It'll, it'll come to me. But the pur the purpose of this is that as an accredited investor, the the uh, entities or the other trusts cannot be formed specifically for the sole purpose of investing in a specific deal. Um, and then entities which all owners are accredited investors. So those are your options as far as trusts and or entities. Everybody's an accredited investor or there's $5 million or more in the in the entity or um, trust, so some people for some reason do not know how to find uh, sometimes where their um, income base, their wages are are located. So here's just a a graph on where to find them. Uh, part one or or number one and number nine in your ten forty. So in your W-2 form, box one, and your 1040, 
line nine. And people will actually find that helpful. Because there's so many numbers going up and down that they can just look at that and make that determination. All right. So back to the network, you know, million dollars or more of ownership uh, in, in regard. And that, that includes um, jewelry, cars, vacation homes, just not your primary residence, even inheritance and things of that nature. We have actually a network calculator that we put together. Um, I will drop it off. I will drop it in the in the chat at the end but um pretty much it allows you to just kind of punch in information punch in numbers and calculates everything for you so that's a good thing to offer your investors just a net worth calculator so that they can do it on their at their leisure you know they don't want to um they don't want to ask your cpa to do this for them because they might charge them so they can just do it at their leisure and just come up with because they don't tell their cpa hey i own you know, this much in jewelry or this much in in whatever. This is what my cars were. Sometimes they don't share all that type of stuff with their CPA. So they could add that stuff, send it to the CPA and combine all that information to figure out that their net worth is over a million dollars. Yeah. That's just something to consider. Jeff, some CPAs will refuse to do that assertion for you. I know that because mine is one of those. Okay. Well, so verify then, investor you know, websites or terms. Yeah, so I mean, there's, so I'm going to, I'm going to provide that at the end, but there's companies that would do that for you yes, for a fee. You. Um, well, like for us, we actually um, have that as part of our uh, in doc process and we pay for the, the letter, the accreditation letter. You do? So they just send, send everything to them and we'll, we'll just pay for that. Wow, when, that's, when their that's CPAs nice. won't do it. That's so, very nice. So, and then spousal equivalent, this is a new thing that came out, um, you know, we're in the, in, in the new age. So um, spousal equivalent doesn't refer to only um, man and woman. It can be someone in a spousal role. So like a gay partner, is that what you mean? A what? A gay partner. Yes. Yes. Or some, or sometimes some people don't even get married. They're just like common law marriage. Or and the biggest so thing, so it's, it's kind of like a gray area, I think. Um, so, but there's guidelines that these uh, equivalent partners um, need to be living together for the last 12 months and intend to remain together. Um, neither are married to somebody else, to anybody else. 18 years of age and uh, competent to consent to contracts. So um, that's a protective thing, I think. They are not related by blood to a degree of closeness that would prohibit legal marriage, illegal marriage in states of which they legally reside, and they are jointly responsible for each other's common welfare and financial obligations. Um, and they reside together, again, in the same residence for the last 12 months and intend to do so indefinitely. So there's some things there that um, just, it's kind of like those fine, you know, fine text type of things that, when you have investors, people that want to invest with you, and they may be married or not married, there's these little nuances that you can ask to make sure that you're protected because you don't want to get fined because you offered. Because together they make three hundred thousand, but the one that wants to invest makes one hundred and ninety-five thousand by themselves, but they're considered a spousal equivalent. So there's those little type of things, situations there that may um, may need to be mentioned just to for protection purposes, because you don't want to end up being fined um, or even just sharing the information around. Because some people that don't know that they're kind of in the in a somewhat marriage situation, but they're not legally married, they may be qualified. They may be three hundred thousand dollars together, but because they're not married, they might say, "Oh well, I can't invest because we're not married." I make. 150,000 and I make 150,000 and that puts them right in that a credit investor, uh, you know, um, definition. So back to the licenses, uh, folks that qualify now from August 2020 amendment is our folks that holding series 765 and 82 licenses. So you got your investment uh, advisor representative 
investment advisor representative, IRAs, um, your general security representative, and, and your uh, private security offering representative. So as an example, um, someone seeking a credit investor stand, uh, status, just to become an accredited investor, might go out and get their 65 series. But they have to, one, hang hang their, their license at a um, investment advisor office of, or a firm. Then they have to pay for those fees, the annual fees, the state fees. And I'm not sure if there's federal fees involved, but there's additional fees that they might have to pay. But some people may go out to get their five series, for example, just to become accredited investors. So, so you're sometimes, saying, is this sometimes part of it might not even law? be worth it. Yeah, Jeff, are you saying that that Series 65 test is part of the new law where they have to hang that certificate in an office? They, it's kind of like a, like, a, like a real estate agent. They can't, they have to hang their license. A broker, a broker. Yeah. Yeah. So it's it's pretty much along the same thing. They, they just can't get their uh, Series 65 and just keep it to themselves. They have to put it with some kind of, uh, I think they clean, I think it's a broker as well. I'm not sure the, the name of the, the, whatever the firm, but they have to hang their hat someplace. They just can't take this, take the exam, qualify and say, Hey, I'm going to create an investor. Here's my license. No, you have to go hang it someplace. Um, so that's what the, the additional fees come and see, and they have to determine if the fees that they have to pay annually are even worth it. So, um, so that's just something to consider. Um, if somebody's maybe talking to you about doing it too, they may want to look at all those avenues. But if they're also like an IRA and they don't even know they qualify and they do it anyway, you could tell them, Hey, do you know you're a credit investor? You want to invest with me? So, um, just something to think about. Well, it's just a lot to think about. Oh my goodness. Yeah. All right. So, all right. So here are, um, when it comes to uh, determining or taking steps to verify that an investor is accredited, there's different options. One is their CPA, but if their CPA is not willing to do it, you have these third party companies, accred, that's who we use. Um, we worked with Parallel Markets there a while back, but now we're working with the CRED um, Verify Investor. So these are just some examples of third parties that will create a um, an accredited investor letter for for that investor, and all they have to do is submit all their tax documents for the past two years, and they're able to create a letter for them where they could submit, and you can upload it into the investor portal. And then you have those other options, invest in investment advisor, an attorney can do that for them as well, and a CPA or accountant. And we do also have a, a, a credit verification letter example that we can send out if somebody will kind of use it and, and make it their own so they can send to their investors so they could present that. Yeah, um, Christopher has a question in the chat. So, um, I got involved with syndication duty. Well, Chris, it, it was was it a five hundred six B for non accredited investors, or was it a five hundred six C for accredited investors? Usually, the PPM will um, say in there somewhere that this is a an accredited deal. Was the deal advertised, or was the deal from somebody you've known for at least thirty days? Because there's a requirement to have an uh, investor and syndicator or firm needs to have that substantial relationship. And there's a 30-day window where from the day you, you establish that relationship, that any deals before that legally can't count. Um, and there has to be like a 30-day gap. I mean, that, that the relationship can be actually created within like one day. You know, you get on a call. In the morning, you meet in the afternoon, have lunch. In the evening, you are having another call. Three touches. Um, but uh, but yeah, it, it, it depends. It, was it 
if you know if it was a 506B or 506C, let us know. But um, but if it was a 506C, you do need a letter that confirms you are an accredited investor. So I had that verify investor and it only is good for three months and it costs you again if you want to revamp it. And I also had some LPs that would ask for that. And then a couple of years back, they didn't ask for it, but they did ask about how much property I owned, mm -hmm. free and clear, and if it was my primary residence or not. So they may have done their own background. You know, they can look on any county role and figure out who owns a property. So uh, maybe that's what they did in the background, and I just didn't know it at the time. So. Yeah, that's that's pretty. Um... Pretty pretty flimsy. It's pretty risky. Yeah. yeah. Um, I was just saying what they did. Yeah, they're they're taking a lot of, a lot a lot of, of liability on themselves by saying that they did the due diligence. Um, yeah, I mean the best way is to get some kind of someone that handles your finances to write you a letter confirming this, your attorney or, or a third party. So, yeah, but I, I we could send out a uh, example letter. That you could have it. Okay, so you got a credit letter uh, from, from the, the website. website. Oh, okay, geez. so you probably submitted all your documentation for the past previous two years in order for them to make that confirmation because that's what it requires. Two years, the previous year, the two previous years of pretty much getting your taxes done to confirm that your income was the two hundred as a single individual or three hundred thousand as a married individual. So if you got a letter, then you probably you're probably in good in good uh in a good situation there. And it's probably you need it because it was probably an accredited investor only deal. So you you should be good to go. What it sounds like. And hey, hey yeah, that's short and sweet. Um, like I said, it's very very uh high, high, high viz. Um, like I said, there's other, there's other, there's a 504. Um, option in in the 501 regulation D, but I have not met many people that do that um, that option. But because the 504 allows you to raise up to five million dollars within a 12 month window, so it kind of minimizes your your growth. So a lot of uh, firms don't do that; they just do either a 506 B or a 506 C in uh, 501 regulation D. But um, but if you have any questions, here's my email address. There's a website. Let me uh, let me go ahead and drop the that link if you want to create your own net worth calculator. Net worth calculator. Chris Lawrence, Harita, thank you for joining us. Paula as well. Hopefully um, this hopefully it was helpful. Um, we ask please do send. Um, some topics of interest so that we can provide value. Uh, if not, we're just going to keep going with whatever's next, but uh, it'd really be helpful so that we can put something together that would be helpful for you. I mean, we could even talk about real estate, you know, fix and flips, you know, <laughs> we could do we, that. We want to talk about uh, investing as an LP from your IRA. Because okay. I'm well, the one that got burned on the 990T. My accountant says, you're doing what? And I'm like, well, you know, I, I just thought I'd give you K-1s from my other properties. If you want K-1s from the ones that are in the IRA, we, we you got to tell me that because all I know is they're negative. And so what does that tell you? That if I didn't turn in a K-1 that was negative, I probably got cheated on my tax. I probably paid too much, not too little, right? So, I mean, who got hurt here? Me. So mm -hmm. it, it yeah. would be good to know if you're investing in property from an IRA, what's going to be re required by tax. Yeah. And I also got to, the, the syndicator needs to know that they're marking it properly because sometimes they won't market who it's going to properly. Because it, if it's an IRA, if they don't market on their side and they run the numbers differently, there's, there's always on their side, there's always, you mean as the GP that's that's reporting to the IRS? Is that what you mean? Yeah, that's that's getting your K one ready. Um, there's different ways those those K ones can be drawn up when it comes to different self directed IRA 
in a regular investment, like if you if you have a company that invested, sometimes they'll look at it. Oh, is this must be a company just investing in different, different math that they that 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 can be done. Yes, because so, they still do the cost seg and the bonus depreciation. We just give them their EIN number. We don't get it; they get it, and so and then the GPs get it, of course. Mm -hmm. And so um, you know, I'm I'm wondering who if that's really a good deal. Maybe it's better to take the money out and just invest from your own company outside the IRA. And sometimes with a self-directed RA is better to just invest in short-term real estate deals. You know, be the bank, lend it to a fix and flip, you know, company and get your 12% return in six, seven months and do it again and do it again and do it again. 12%? So, mm -hmm. Okay. I'm comparing that to a short-term T-bill. Like, hmm, I guess that's good. That's I that's what rest. I pay my investors, 10 to 12% uh, for short term um, for residential fix and flips. Something something else to consider, Jeff, is that when you tell us to invest from our IRA, you, my IRA, I have to give you full disclosure, was Equity Trust, and they actually had to vet the paperwork and the deal mm -hmm. and everything. So it yeah. took, uh, once I got assigned to a person, it took an extra week to move the money so all in all, it was like 2.5 weeks. And so if somebody's fighting a deadline, you know, you kind of have to plan for that and get somebody that knows how to turn it, turn key. Mm -hmm. It's not going to just happen like when you go to your bank and you wire money. That's not well, what happens. And also, they could also get registered with Equity Trust or like we're registered with New View. So if somebody, someone has a self-directed IRA with New View, um, New View already has our PPM. New View has all all our documentation so that streamlines the the, the process what that is that you time. is that a portal of some sort you view new view they, they also do self-directed new... iras they're almost like equity trust okay well yeah. there's many of them out there and just some of them are more nimble than others it just depends on also what you're used to setting up in your portal but mm -hmm. I, I just was not ready for them to have to scrutinize my deals they do they have to look at it and make sure money's going, you know, to a reputable source and all of that. So it took right. Long. I mean, they want all the documentation because it, yeah. it, I mean, it makes sense. Yeah. So I mean, yeah. they don't want the investor to lose money on doing something that doesn't fit the self-directed IRA because it could have been your own deal and your own money. Oh, we can't do that. That's prohibited. Right. So yeah. um, or that'd or be, relative or something like that. That would be a yeah, slap so. for sure. <laughs> Okay, thank you, Jeff. I'm out of here. See you guys. Okay. All right. Good night, everybody. Thank you for uh, hanging out, and we'll see you guys in thank December. You. Have a great, happy Thanksgiving. We'll yes, see, you see you then. Bye, y'all. Bye.